But I am going to be talking about something very similar to what was scheduled, which is the visual design principles. And my point is that why do we want to be thinking about design principles? Um, you're not here to learn how to be a better artist, I think, although there's nothing wrong with that. You want, you want to be a more effective communicator. And to say that you don't have time to make better figures because you're focused on the science is actually logically, in my mind, equivalent to saying, I have the time to spend deciphering other people's bad figures. And the two are equivalent. So I think it's valuable to put the time in to make better figures. And the question is, um, what do you do to, to make that happen? Design, we think of art as a subjective activity. We, we exude some aesthetic, we exude some personality, we put it on the page, and that's us. And no one can argue that it's ugly or pretty. But I think for our use, there are certain objective aspects of design that we can hold on to, and we can say, there is a method that will make my communication more effective. Because just as art can be a form of emotional communication, which we may want to do in science, we may want to inspire, we may want to energize. Fundamentally, we want to communicate facts, proportions, relations, quantitative information. And so we're still trying to communicate. Now, objective aspects of design. I show this picture, and many of you may have seen it, because I think one of these creatures is more attractive than the other. And I think that that opinion is held by the majority of people on the planet. <laughs> OK. So it's an, it may be a little hyperbolic, but I think it's a good example that, that there are certain things that we look for and we respond to. Uh, there are activities in which people put together things that they consider to be unattractive and show them to the world almost as an example of schadenfreude and perhaps as a way to say, please don't do this. <laughs> now, this exists in the literature. People publish things like this. And you're thinking, oh, but that's not us. We don't do this in science. Yes, we do. <laughs> now, you know, if my grandparents were alive and I were to come home and say, I am now grown up, I'm doing science, oh, how wonderful, can you show us something that you do? I, wouldn't, I would rather show the thing on the left. At least it's, it's humorous. The thing on the right lacks any redeeming qualities. And yet, <laughs> I, I'm ashamed of it. I am ashamed of it, and I, and I have had no connection to it. OK, so what does that look like in visual communication? Well, the thing on the left, I think, is much more effective than the thing on the right. And I think that the ways in which it is more effective can be identified, and it can be very easily repeated even by someone who doesn't have an emotional reaction to the quality of the figure on the left versus the lack of quality of the figure on the right. So this is the thing, is that what are the recipes? What are the things you can do practically when you go home or to your lab where you live uh, and do in your software application to make things better? So the two. Activities are a process, and do think of design as a process. Um, and, and just as science is a process, it is not the body of knowledge that it is often mistaken for. Design is a process. It is some set of rules that we follow. We don't know where we're going to go, but we know kind of how we're going get, to get there. And the reason why it, it's important to think of it as a process is because you can back up and you can evaluate whether what you've done is a good thing. And it's important that just as in science, we try to take our personality out of the process and and think of ideas externally. In, in the design process, we need, at least in this case for communication, we need to do that too. We need to not be charmed by ineffective forms and not be too precious about what we've created and be open to suggestion. So how does it work? How does figure creating, creation work? You may have some data and you may have a message and you think you need to create a figure. Okay, you think. Whether it's important or not that the figure be created, you, you don't know, but you think so. So you, you select an encoding. Let's say it's the sequence logo. And then you choose some application that, that creates sequence logos. And that's the figure you get, and it's too complicated for you to adjust. And so you keep it, and you write a legend. And in this legend, you might make up for some of the shortcomings of the figure by stating things that aren't exactly obvious, and then you just hope for the best, and that's going to work. 
And this figure is actually uh, the reason why I've chosen it, and if you went to, to Will's breakout talk, is the figure that um, uh, VizWeek, um, BioViz is, is using as part of the, the redesign contest that Bang and I are, are judging and, and chairing, I guess. So we're asking you to improve this figure. Anyway, your figure is done. And if you don't think of design as a process, you, it's very difficult for you to then say, was this process successful? How would I even evaluate it? What are the figures of merit that I can uh, identify? I, I don't know if, if, if it was successful. So the first rule is to be kind of aware of whether the visual is necessary or not. Sometimes we think we need a figure, but really just a few words suffices. Sometimes even being quiet suffices. So this, for example, sign is not necessary. Right? If the sign wasn't there, there would be no problem. I've seen figures like this. This sign is um, also not necessary because it appears to be a warning not to hit your head on the sign. And um, some people think, well, we just need to be more accurate. And if you become more, if you, if you draw the figure more accurately, <laughs> it's, it's still not very useful. Um, OK, so the things I need to think about, what, 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 let's say you now have to have a figure. And again, if the narrative is a little broken up, I'm sorry, it's, I haven't really organized this slide. Is you, you want to be informative and you want to be information rich. And the reason why you want to be information rich is because you want to leverage the real estate on the page and our capacity to pattern match quickly with our visual system large amounts of information. You have to be very careful because there are limitations to that process. But you want to achieve both. So you want to be effective. You want to be both. You don't want to be confusing. That's just information rich. We've seen some of those. And you don't want to be gratuitous, which, which doesn't have enough information to warrant a figure. So what are the properties? I mean, probably some of you. But think about the last one. And I think some of these may be taken directly from Tufti's book. I'm sorry, I haven't checked the references. And it says references here. So that's my template text. You want to give your audience the greatest number of relevant ideas, not just ideas like this figure is terrible, no, this figure is awful, those are bad ideas. Relevant ideas in the shortest amount of time when they're looking at the figure. So you want the figure to address a large number of different questions. And you don't know what those questions are, but can you come up with a figure that addresses them? So particularly in graphics encoding and data encoding, the encoding shouldn't just address a single question. Of course, if you have a single pressing question, that's the encoding you should use. But there's no point in showing it to others unless their question is the same. This is information rich, but it is not informative. Uh, this is not information rich, although it is informative. Both of those. In some way, um, a bang mentioned uh, this idea of the sweet spot. And where is the sweet spot in visualization? Somewhere in between, there is a figure that has a lot of information, uh, like this one, which isn't immediately obvious. But you get the feeling that the complexity in the figure is accessible. If I spend two minutes with it, I will become familiar with reading it. And then the next time I see this kind of figure, I will be better at reading it. And so it's worth to spend a little bit of time learning how to navigate a visualization, particularly one which offers up some reward as a result of that initial learning. So this is, this is, the, this is the most important thing, right? Is you've got to know what you want to say to some degree. You don't want to leave everything up to the audience or the reader. Now, keep in mind that what I'm talking about is communicating. I'm not talking about providing tools for people to explore data. That's a completely different world. I'm talking about creating figures for print or web, typically static figures, and communicating a specific concept or an idea that you or a hypothesis that you've validated. So you have to know what that message is. This sign. For, has, for, has forgotten what its message is. The message is down here. Also, the bridge is out. <laughs> OK, so again, you, you've got to focus on, on the message. That's the most important thing. Here's an example from the literature. And, and I, I'm, I hesitate in using this, but I always wind up using this, because it feels like I'm making fun of a figure which is obviously bad. But I, I am doing that. But I want to focus on a specific part of this figure is the message of the figure. So this figure describes this concept of a DNA book. And only a quarter of the figure 
spends, uh, is used to describe what the book is. The rest of the figure, two th one half of the figure is spent on the delivery mechanisms by which we can get the book, and a quarter is spent saying where the book was made. And, and I think that this figure is not a very effective use of real estate for the message, and I think that, that this is a better way to say what the DNA book is. And every element, nothing can be removed without sacrificing the core message. The idea of the, the if, the, if you remove the scissors, the, the, the dotted punch out line might be weakened. If you remove the DNA here, that will be weakened. If you remove the fact that the page can be taken out of the book, I think the message would be weakened. So I don't need to put the truck, I don't need to put the clip art, I don't need to put the publisher, this is the core. Now you can say, well, where can I get it? Well, I'm glad you asked. You can get it else somewhere and, and you can read the paper and see where you get it. Um, here's a, I wanna walk you through an example of how you can take a, a small um, data set and, and, and generate a message from it. And at what happens at every level of detail to that message. So the idea is that, you know, 10 numbers, uh, I think, um, have a large number of messages in them. They, you don't know what the message is in a series of 10 numbers. If I discretize the numbers, you, the, message, the number of possible messages that I'm conveying to you is reduced. Well, because you don't know what the numbers are, so I'm communicating to you that ranges are important, that you don't need to worry about individual values. If I bin the numbers, then now it's the counts of things within categories that is important, not the individual values. And if finally I do that, then the message is, well, I am seeing fewer numbers in the middle category than I expect, and this is the average. And that's a very narrow message, and that's the message I want to send. And that message is contained within the original numbers, but you cannot see it because you don't know which message is the one I wanted to send. The clarity in the message is the most important thing. Clarity means that you know when to stop talking or drawing, and that the process, the process of design, the process of selecting elements to encode your message is one that's made with purpose. Why am I choosing a square here? Could a circle work? What if I was prevented from placing this element in my figure? What would happen to my message? Would it be lost? And again, to explore data, you need to choose an effective en encoding. And, and I don't, I'm not talking about data exploration here. To communicate concept, you have to use effective design. In other words, choose the least number of visual forms that will deliver your message. So again, I think this is from Tufti. You want to do all of these things. Um, and uh, some of these things, some people break. For example, distorting what the data represents. You know that we are poor at judging areas. So when you show a circle and you're using the area to encode a variable, um, we, we tend to uh, underestimate areas. And so there are some methods to, to try to increase the size of the sh circle to try to align better with how we perceive it. Now you're changing the data and that would be breaking this rule. There, there are certain ways that exist to break some of these rules, but they're done with purpose and so you understand what rule you're breaking. And what I wanna talk about, and um, somebody will tell me when I have to stop talking because uh, I forgot where I was starting, um, is think about communication as a, as a top-down approach. So what do I want to achieve? I want to deliver a message. Okay, well, how do I want to deliver that message? I want to do it with the least amount of redundancy as possible because I value the audience's time. And if I repeat myself tonight, I'm really sorry. Uh, you want to do so consistently. In other words, I don't want to use the same word for different meanings because I'm going to confuse you. I want to be concise. I want to demonstrate to you that I have chosen the words well and I've um, selected them with some idea in a specific meaning. Um, and I want to be honest and I want to be accurate and I want to give you the detail that's necessary for your comprehension, but I want to see these things as three independent qualities. In other words, I can be honest, but not entirely accurate because I'm providing you a zeroth order approximation of my message and because all understanding begins with a zeroth order approximation, right? 
talking to a general audience. If you already have the zeroth order approximation, I won't show it to you, although I think you should always show it to get people on the same page. So accuracy isn't, isn't everything. Uh, here's an example. It's an English sentence, which is grammatically correct. You can find it in Wikipedia. And um, nobody know, I, I'm pretty sure that unless you've seen it, you have no idea what this means. But it's grammatically correct. But then you'll say, well, yes, I know it's grammatically. It doesn't matter that it's correct. I don't get it, and there's something wrong with it. And you cannot title your paper with this sentence. <laughs> and yet, you can put a figure in your paper that looks just like this in visual form, and we accept it. So we, we, we should feel like there's nothing wrong with us. There's something wrong with the thing I'm looking at. So what does this mean? Well, buffalo means three different things. It's an animal, it's a place, and it's a verb meaning to harass. And so the buffalo from buffalo, harass, buffalo, other buffalo from buffalo. OK, fair enough. But these buffalo that are doing the harassing, they're also kind of harassed by buffalo from buffalo. So this is what the sentence actually means. Here's my template text. Isn't that great? Here's the sentence, what the sentence actually means. And, it's, and, and, and so the paper might be on the behavior of North American buffalo, the aggress on the aggressive behavior of North American buffalo. That would be a great title, uh, but not this title. So I wanted to give you the example that accuracy does not necessarily ensure that you will be delivering your message. This is important. Um, and I think it stands on its own. Here's an example of when graphics do a better job than we think. In yesterday's keynote, I believe that Sarah mentioned a point, what if, what if the graphics aren't doing as, as good a job as we think, right? Because we, we think they're doing a really good job and, and, and we're overconfident. And this is the exact opposite. So in this study, doctors were shown four different kinds of visualizations, data encoded in four different ways. And they were asked to make a decision about patient therapies based on what they saw. So they were shown a table, a pie chart, a bar chart, and this icon graph. And then they were evaluated on the accuracy of their decisions. And 82% of them were accurate with the icon uh, graph. And the other visual forms um, led to less um, accurate um, performance. But the, here's, here's the sneaky thing, and maybe you can anticipate what I'm going to show you. Zero percent of the subjects preferred the icon graph at which they were the most accurate performing. And in fact, uh, they voiced considerable contempt for the icon display. But that was only by the doctors. They were preferred by nurses and students. But they were unacceptable by the higher, uh, the, the, the people at the, the, the higher end of the echelon. So this is an, I think it's an interesting study in that sometimes I think we can look at something and have an aesthetic um, uh, draw to it or repulsion from it that is independent from our ability to, to use it. You know, it's kind of like broccoli. Broccoli is good for you. You know it, but you want to eat it. Um, here is a, 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 a very popular and, and incredible optical illusion. These two tables have the same surface. But you cannot tell that because of the ridiculous orientation of these tables. And we should never have visual visualizations based on what are essentially optical illusions. Visualizations we cannot compare. We cannot, I wouldn't want you to compare these tables because you are, you're prejudiced against correct comparison. And yet, we have these visualizations which we cannot compare, these network layouts. This is the biggest problem with the network layout is that you cannot compare three small network layouts when they're put side by side. And if I can't compare them, their individual use is limited. Now, you look at this, and if I ask you, can you derive any kind of conclusion from what I'm showing you, you cannot. And yet, they represent the identical network, except this one is missing an edge and this one is missing a node. But by the act of the layout mechanism, uh, this symmetry and the differences have been lost. It's not perceptually uniform. I'm aware that there's a large number of different layouts possible, and you could probably tune a specific layout to this problem. But again, as I mentioned before, you want to be able to address the largest number of questions um, in the smallest amount of space as you can, and you don't necessarily want to 
you, you may not be able to choose your layout based on the question because you don't know which layout will satisfy it. This is important. You have to respect the fact that your audience is limited and that they have certain physiological properties of their visual cortex and their retina, which they cannot overcome. So everyone will agree that these colors, these grays are the same, but as soon as I put them in the proximity of another color, you have to work very hard to convince yourself that they're the same, and I think you cannot succeed. I think you will just have to take my word for it. You cannot, you're, you cannot reprogram your retina to behave differently around this issue. And of course, in art, this is used to great effect. I love this poster, it's a beautiful poster. And yet in science, it is not used to great effect because heat maps, and that's something Bang mentioned in one of the columns he's written, is if you look at these three colors, uh, they're actually the same color, but this one looks lighter than this one, than this one because of its neighbors. And that's a very difficult limitation to overcome and maybe one that cannot be overcome in this form, but you have to be aware of it. Um, another one is, is contrast. Um, we cannot read this gap as well as we can here. And so think about the fact that when you're placing dark text on a dark background, when the contrast difference between the foreground and the background is too similar, things become illegible. And it's not just enough that one thing is black and one thing is red. The overall luminosity, the, the, the brightness of the color, or the brightness of the tone is similar, and that's what I mean by contrast. Um, think, uh, if you haven't heard of the Brewer palettes, I, I encourage you to investigate them. They're originally from cartography, and they're a selection of color palettes that are perceptually selected by an individual named Cynthia Brewer that she felt worked well to demonstrate um, uh, quantitative uh, data changes or qualitative categorical data changes. And so when you're making, for example, a flow chart which uses uh, a gray, and here, again, this might encode some information, if you uniformly space your grays in the RGB spectrum, um, you'll get this, this sudden shift from what looks like dark gray to white, whereas if you use Brewer, that gradation will be smoother and it will appeal to your uh, reader better. This is very important, and all of these things are important, but perhaps this is critical, is that you want to reduce the number of degrees of freedom in your figure to depend only on the variation in the data. You don't want to be varying things for no reason, for no good reason. All the reasons that a variation should be very, very, very good. Here's an example where a splicing diagram is changing, the spacing between in intron exon is changing, um, the size of the intron is changing for no good reason. They're just trying to show you the patterns. And the patterns get lost because your brain has to factor out all of the variation that isn't important. And in the end, you don't know if that variation isn't important or not. You have to read the legend. And they have to go, well, did they mean something by it? And, they, and the author may not have meant anything by it, so they didn't write it down. And you keep searching and searching, and you'll search in vain. Uh, consistency is something I mentioned. You want to be as consistent as possible. Here's a figure that uses the same element to, to encode a wavelength and dye. And you can understand what they were trying to say. They were trying to say that this dye responds to this wavelength. That's good. So there is a, they share a common property, but they are not to be represented by the same visual form because they're two different things. So here's a, a way that you might do that. You might say, well, um, the color will be the wavelength, and the beam of light you know, kind of looks like a rectangle, perhaps, and then the dye would look something like that because it's attached to a base, and it's a, a chromophore, and it reacts to light, so it's a little ball. It's a little molecule. Um, here's an example where um, arrows are done poorly and inconsistently, and, and arrows are all over this diagram, and they mean different things. In most of the cases, the arrows simply provide a direction of the flow of time, which is up. But in this case, the thickness of the arrow encodes the rate of evolution. But this arrow is thicker than this arrow, but there the thickness means nothing. So on one hand, you're using the size of an element to encode data. On the other one, you're not. Uh, don't do that. This is, this is very distracting. Um, and in fact, I, I would suggest that instead of that, which is a simplified version of the figure, 
um, you would lose all the arrowheads because they're redundant. Time flows up. You only need to say that once. And everything else can be a line. OK, so redundancy, the reason why you don't want to be redundant is because everyone has to check whether the things that you've repeated on the page is in fact the same or there's a small difference in it. And it's actually quite hard to, uh, to spot that. And then I'll have some examples. Uh, here's a kind of a classic one where you're, look, you're asked to look for the differences. And if you're change blind and you can't see where the differences are because the same information is repeated over and over and over again. So you would never do that, right? You would do something perhaps like this where you factor out the things that are in common. Show any one thing at most once. Never show it more than once, unless, unless some incredibly specific reason calls for it. OK, that's the same slide. Um, <laughs> I, no, I didn't mean that at all, actually. I, I really did. Um, here is, and, and I'm not sure if this falls in the same category, but it's an important one. It has to do with arrows, and it has to do with just being overwhelming. Um, this figure can be, can be simplified quite a bit. For one, one thing, the, arrow, the concept of the arrow is not very important. They're all pointing in the same direction. And we love to put arrows on genes, and we love to demonstrate the direction of transcription and, and the notion that things are, are pointed, that they have, a, they have an orientation. But a lot of times, this doesn't matter to our message. We don't need that arrow. We have to divorce ourselves from these visual forms, which, which we feel are essential. They're often not essential. Um, and they're arbitrarily selected and colored. And in fact, the pattern, if you center the figure on this, this arrow, which is A-R-E, you see the pattern much better. Now, this is also pretty good, and it's the first one that I, I redesigned, and I was happy with that for a long time. But then I thought, well, why do I have a legend which only labels a single element? Why don't I just put that name of the element next to it? And so you obviate the need for a legend. If you're going to have a legend, make sure that the legend is actually shortening what you would normally do if you didn't have that legend. This notion of data to ink ratio is very important. If you're drawing your figure, and, and someone in the breakout session mentioned this, and I'll repeat this again because it's really, really important. When you sit in front of an application, you have this tendency to simply go to the menus and select the shapes and draw them, and all oh, that gradient looks good. Oh, well, look, I could do that. Oh, that's really cool, and you just leave it in. But if you're asked to first draw that figure on paper, it's unlikely that you spend a lot of time putting in the gradient, because it takes too much time. And you won't think of it, because the thing that's on your mind is the message. And you're going to want to spend the least amount of work drawing things on the page. And so you want to spend the least amount of ink demonstrating the information. Here is a figure which is using a, a, a terrific amount of ink. And a lot of times, this, this falls into this concept of redundancy and conciseness, too. It uses a lot of ink, and it repeats itself many, many times. It commits um, some number of small crimes. Because if you notice that this is donor multiple, and the multiple is repeated here and middle, and then you're wondering, well, is there a pattern? What is the pattern? Well, it actually falls quite nicely into a table. And so if there is a hierarchy in the information, respect the hierarchy. Help the user get themselves organized by organizing things for them. Um, I don't want to talk about this figure because I don't think I have time. Remove to improve. One of the best things that I think you can do, and most figures can be improved this way, you just take stuff away. Just remove it. Just leave it, leave it alone. Put it down. And it's kind of like if you have storage. You know, you have some kind of storage somewhere you're paying 200 bucks a month for. You don't even know what's in there and you keep carrying it with you. you know, every time you move, you have this box you never even open. You don't even know what's in it, but you feel like you need to move it. Um, just let go of it. Here's an example of a figure which uh, tells you some information about the telomeres. Now, I know where the telomeres are, and we all know they're at the ends of the chromosomes. But I don't need to show you the entire chromosome to tell you anything about the telomere. And yet, most of the ink in this figure is spent drawing the chromosomes. And OK, fair enough. You want to add some authenticity to it, some, some realism that's more than naive. But are you sure you're not being fooled? Are you a cytogeneticist? Can you really tell that those bands are the right ones? Or did I just make this up? Huh, you don't know. So you've got to look it up. 
You see, you were just fooled into thinking you know something. And you were just fooled into a false sense of security. Well, I see some banding. That must be right. Well, no, it's probably, it, it is right, but it may not be right. So, so, so remember that when you see something that adds to your confidence that you're just not, you're not being fooled. So here is a, a way to do this. Um, and it uses the idea, uh, I'll talk about that in another example, but the chromosomes are removed. So uh, clarity, you, you want to, if you are asking someone to compare things, to, to have some judgment about areas, about, about quantitative pers um, um, ratios, uh, make sure that you place things on the page that are in, an, in a way that's aligned to help them make those decisions clearly. I don't really know what's going on here. I, for example, is the outer radius of this um, ventricle the same as the outer radius of this ventricle? The, the inner radius is smaller, but is the outer radius the same? I, I don't know. Is it important? I, I don't know. Is the idea that just the wall is, inside wall is shrinking or the whole thing is shrinking? I, I don't know. So, and, and you know, maybe you don't ask yourself these questions, but, but I think you should because you might be led to believe the wrong thing. So by just aligning things, the comparison is better. Always align as much as you can. And then being explicit, even if you want to be really explicit, put little arrows to indicate what's changed. Focus and emphasis is important because everything cannot have the same degree of priority and the same degree of importance in a figure. If I shout every sentence, it's like not shouting. So contrast is important because contrast provides focus. We love pictures like this because the lines are clear and crisp and we know this is a man and we know these are swans and it's beautiful. And as soon as I decrease the contrast, the effect of the image is lessened. So here's a figure where everything shouts and therefore nothing can be heard. And here's a figure where there's no contrast at all and therefore I don't even know where to begin. And so you, you don't want either of those things. But imagine if you took one of these eggs here and you placed it in here. That would stand out. That would be the wrong choice, but it would stand out. <laughs> so you, you want these two figures to kind of have babies, and, and they would make the perfect figure. What winds up happening when you look at things is that your, your visual system very rapidly converges onto a uh, uh, an idea of what is important, what is visually salient, what stands out. So when you look at this uh, series of four dots in your mind, magically, and very rapidly, this is what your mind sees. The orange stands out and the green recedes in importance. It's very easy for you to spot that. And in other cases, this doesn't happen. And so this notion of salience is important. Things stand out. Take advantage of that, but don't overdo it. Um, I'll skip this, sorry. Um, I will skip this. I, I was going to take these out because they, they repeat some of the points I'm making. Here's an important thing about shapes. Um, if you, I don't know if you can read this legend from far away. It's very difficult to know whether this legend, whether these categories form any kind of classification, whether there is any organization to them until you actually read them. And it's actually fairly complex because some of them are missing. And when you put it in like this, you realize, oh, there's two categories in situ and in literature, and there is kinds of four kinds of genes. And for some cases, I don't have selective in literature genes. And if literature is a triangle and in situ is a circle, then specific selective and non-selective can be given gradients of, of visual importance. And you can start to understand the overall figure much better than these shapes, which don't really relate very much to one another. Here's some examples. And I'm going to, I have some examples. Just tell me when to stop talking, because this is my last section. I wanted to give you an idea of what it would look like um, if I was sitting down and either creating a figure or redesigning a figure. Somebody in our, in our breakout session mentioned that she enjoyed um, CELL's uh, GTA, Guidelines to Authors, because it described what to do for a visual abstract. And it gave her some tips as how to create one. And that's fantastic. And here's a one visual abstract by a different person, I think out of CELL. And it's, it's not that bad, but it does actually commit errors 
that you may not spot right away. And some questions are raised in this um, figure. Uh, one of them is, is what is the relationship between, what is ERFS? And you look down here, it's early replication fragile site. So it looks like a place. ERFS is a place, places in the genome that look like they're affected as part, in this part of the cell cycle. What is AID? And you, is it a place? No, it turns out that AID is, is a protein. So a protein and a place are given the same visual weight and meaning, whereas underlying meaning is quite different. And the chromosome is red and the chromosome is blue here. And you have to ask yourself, well, you, you know that's a chromosome, but this is an overly ornate depiction of the chromosome. And why is the chromosome blue? It's the idea that it selects the, the, this, this, this mechanism selects particular chromosomes? Or is it that this chromosome is just the one that I'm using and I want to associate it with this mechanism? That's why I colored it blue. Does the color blue belong on the chromosome or does it belong on the place or does it belong to the mechanism? Where is blue? And in this case, if you actually look at it, this position of the cut is not exactly the position on the cut here. So the figure is a little inaccurate. But I'm using this as an example because this is the visual abstract in this paper. And the authors have a figure in the paper that describes exactly that process in a figure, but in a much more complex way. But it's the same process. And what they're saying is that they have this AID mitigated mechanism and this replication stress mechanism that causes genetic breaks. One happens in G1 and one in S. And there's also the possibility that the S1 happens first and then the G1 happens second. Okay, but and there's all these complex labels that repeat themselves, they're redundant, but you have to check that they're actually the same. And you have to figure out, well, what do you really mean? Are these two different instances of this process or is it just one shifted in time? And then there is cancer if you have this translocation. Um, so here's an idea where the authors, I think, generated this figure first, my guess. And then they were asked to do a visual abstract. And then they managed to shorten it actually fairly well. But they didn't go back to the figure and, learn, and apply what they learned in making the abstract in shortening the figure. So let's see how this can be improved. And I worked on this last night, and I don't think that I have the exact right thing, because there's no one right thing, but I think some ways are better, and I want to give you a sense of maybe what I was thinking when I was doing it. So the first thing I did is just I removed some things that I don't think were important, such as the outer um, outline of the cell cycle. I don't, I don't think that's important, and I just left everything else, except maybe the chromosomes. I don't think you need to show the full X of the chromosome. That's not important. I think everybody knows that that's a chromosome. And um, one thing that they didn't mention is the replication stress as a mechanism of break in the visual abstract. They put the mechanism AID as on in the visual abstract, but here they didn't say what the mechanism was. So they have this term for the mechanism, and I think that that belongs in there. So I put it in for them. So uh, the next, and I, I toned down the arrows here and so on. So here's the figure, and here's the, the, the next one, the next version. I thought, well, why are these chromosomes outside of the circle? How do I associate them with this and uh, this half and this half? So I, I initially colored them uh, blue and red. And I thought, well, what if I put them inside? This is, I think, a good idea because it makes, puts in the center of the figure what the figure is about, which is this translocation. And then I put the labels in closer to the inside the, uh, the lines for the abstract, uh, for the cell cycle, and I removed the arrows because I thought, no, I think everybody pretty knows the cell cycle goes around. So I don't think you need arrows, although you might disagree with me, but if you think you needed arrows, I would only leave one, which is the one up there. I wouldn't leave all the arrows because the idea of it going around in a circle is obvious. So here's the color. I don't think that the chromosomes should be colored. I think that 
the mechanism or the place should be colored to associate that in this half of the cycle, some specific locations are associated with it, because it could be any chromosome. So I removed the color. And then I thought, well, no, I st still don't like the fact that it's the place that's colored. So I removed the color in the place. And I kept the mechanism uh, in color. And then finally, um, I thought that this was too close to the center chromosome, so I moved it off to the side. And then I thought this was too close to the bottom, so I moved everything up. And I think that that's the final view. And I think, oh, and I made these smaller. I actually made these the same typeface as these, the same size and bold, because I wanted to associate um, the mechanism more closely with the cell cycle phase. I think that's the last one. OK, well, and here's the before and here's the after. Um, so in another example, we needed to create a visual abstract. Actually, this is really, this was really hard, very, very painful process. Because you need to identify what your deliverable message is supposed to be. It was a book chapter about sequencing cancers and new technologies in sequencing. And here are the keywords that were associated with the book chapter. Sean, how much time do I have? Oh, really? Oh, OK, awesome. So, OK, sorry? Oh, OK, I don't need to go over it. But here are the key words of the chapter. So cancer, cancer genomics, tumor heterogeneity, mutation discovery, whole genome sequencing, personalized medicine. You know, how am I going to put this stuff on paper? And the thing about the requirements for the abstract is that it had to fit in a 500 by 200 pixel rectangle. <laughs> OK, so you know, you're like, oh, well, I, I can't I can make things too small. I have to make things legible. And that's actually quite a significant restriction because it's going to be published online. So it's not just in print, it's online. So that, those pixels are the ones that I have. I don't have any more pixels. But what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? What is important here? And, and you know what, when you're at the stage where you think what is important, you have to think, well, what can I do? What, what could I show? And, and what is essential? I know I can't put everything down. I know I can't be fully accurate, but I have to be honest, and I have to give people a flavor. And I was really lucky to have seen this figure um, in Yates, which describes the evolution of cancer, and this idea that cancer is composed of clones, cell, cell groups, which are derived from these original cells which have had some kind of a mutation that give rise to these new families of cells. And then when you, this is a really nice figure, and then when you, perform some kind of therapy, you address or you, 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 do, you kill the cells that are, that are sensitive, and those cells die off. But unfortunately, there are some resistant cells in the cancer, and those continue to grow, and at some point it metastasizes and so on. This figure has a few problems, but it's, I thought this was a great way to show the concept of cancer evolution and heterogeneity. So I decided to use this as a template and start off with a normal cell, and I said, just we did this. And that was the first look at the figure. And I thought, well, if we could just overlay on top of this the concept of evolution of sequence technology, we would have addressed the two points, which is that one informs the other, that this new sequence technologies improves our understanding of cancer. And this is what cancer is like, this is what makes it complex to study, and this is where the technologies step in. So in the next version, I thought, well, let's put in sequencing, some aspect of the sequencing, such as amplification. So the one thing about third generation technologies is that no amplification is necessary. And so the biases that are associated with amplifying DNA are not there. And that we would sample a single cell tumor regions and whole tumor. And I indicated the concept of sampling by these drop bars with a certain, they look like dipsticks. OK, well, and, I, and, I, and I, the first thing, I, I knew that this was not going to be the final thing. Uh, and that's one of the things that you have to accept is when you create anything, is the first idea is a good one, and you put it away. And that's not the best one. You may come back to it, but you have to do so very carefully. Because that was your first idea, and you want to seek safety in that idea. And you want to say how wonderful I was in figuring something out so early on. But oftentimes, that, that's, that's charming you into, into a, a sense of confidence. Um, moved things around. Uh, instead of saying first generation, second generation, third generation, I put first, second, and third. Um, th somebody maybe wanted read length, and the typical sample was, was added, um, but, but not, not much else was changed. 
Um, and then I thought, well, let's, it's too much information up here. This is a visual abstract. And, and all of this is true, and all of this is perhaps relevant, but not at the point of the visual abstract. So removed some information and just indicated um, across which region the technologies uh, were relevant across which region of sampling. So from the whole tumor to tumor regions to single cell and single molecule. And what I was trying to do here is, is, is represent the concept of a single cell and the concept of a single molecule somehow. And I, I, I was not successful here, uh, I think. And notice that what I've done is I've changed the circles, which were the driver mutations, to, to axes because a circle was already used to indicate cell. And axes are kind of a universal symbol for something has gone wrong. So I like the axis. Um, and in the next step, uh, remove information about, change this table to look like something like this. And this is also not completely correct. So some accuracy is lost because you can apply first generation Sanger sequencing to a, a subpart of cancer. Yes, you can. You can take a smaller sample, amplify it, and use Sanger sequencing on it. But the idea was to kind of interleave the, the, the development of sequencing together with a development of understanding of cancer, and so that we can now sample individual parts of a tumor quickly and cheaply, and that's why we do it. And what I've done here is there's the second experimental can be applied to single cells, and really single molecule sequencing can only be done by the third generation. And here for the molecule, there's a little DNA strand in there, and I, may, you may not be able to see it because it's, it's a dark background. And in the next example, this has changed a little bit. I don't know if you see it. What it is, it's a dot, which is like a cell with a little dot inside it to indicate only a part of the cell is being sequenced. So this idea that a subpart of the cell is enough to indicate individual molecule. Um, and then something happened to the figure. Uh, which is around, around here, between here and here. The author said, well, this looks good, but after therapy, the cell's population decreases very rapidly. And I was very resistant to include that in the figure because I thought it would break the aesthetic, this idea that it decreases, but we don't really need to communicate the rate at which it decreases at the level of the visual abstract. But they insisted, and now I agreed because they're the author, and so we wound up doing something like that. And personally, I don't like this version as much as before, even though it's more accurate. You'll also see that this rate of expansion, this is flares outward, the idea that the rate is increasing, and so that when you have a relapse in cancer, the cells come back faster, more aggressively. And I didn't think that that was important to encode because I think it, again, broke some of the aesthetic. But also, it may be missed by the reader. They may not see this shape as relevant. They may just think that I picked an odd shape. So um, I hope that this helped in kind of showing you how a message can be identified, how elements can be moved around, and how things can be, can be pared down to show just the essential things. Um, and so here is the um, original full figure, and here's, here's the final full figure. Um, here's another example of a figure redesign, which is this one, which is also from this book chapter. Um, and what the idea is that there's some, there's some tumor, and we take a sample, and this sample has two different um, cell clones, so different cell types. And within each of these cell types, again, there are different cells. There's a cancer cell from clone one here in this area, which is mostly red, although it might have some orange cells from clone two. This one is mostly orange. There are these stem cells, which are purple, which give rise to other cells. There's some necrotic cancer cells, which are dead. There are neoplastic ones, ones which are about to become cancerous, and then normal cells, and so on. The first thing you notice is that there's no real intuitive sense that purple cells give rise to red cells. Purple doesn't necessarily give you red. And so this choice of color to indicate that the stem cell is somehow more aggressive and somehow more important is, I don't think, a good one. It's also not very good that it comes third in the legend. And but the idea here is about the clone. But you don't really know that until you associate this color with, with these. 
And yes, there's a lot of cells in this sample, and they're all overlap. But it's not actually necessary to demonstrate that there's a lot. We know there's a lot of cells, and we know they kind of stick together. But they don't overlap in three dimensions. They are well bounded. So that was the first version of the redesign. Said, so, well, I think we can kind of show all of these shapes in one. We can say, here's the tumor, here's the sample, and the tumor is made up of, say, two clones. And when we sample the tumor, we get a bit of clone one and a bit of clone two. And within these clones, you have different kinds of cells. Um, and I thought, well, but we don't need to show that many cells. We can, we can get by with fewer. Is it time? OK, that was my last example. We can get by with fewer cells. And also, we can, I think, work a little harder to encode the cells with symbols that suggest their meaning. So the prickly thing looks like it, it's, it's quite harmful to touch. And that's the one that is the most dangerous, and that's the stem cell. Then the solid mass is cancer. It's like a tumor, you know, something you feel. Then the one that's about to be cancer is kind of almost solid, but not quite. The one that's dead is solid but faded. The normal one is just the standard default circle. And then there's the stromal cell, which they wanted. It's a type of normal cell. And if a cell has particular genes that are mutated in it, they're indicated by letters. So the idea is that clone 2 has AC mutated, and clone 1 has A and B mutated. And then I moved the thing around because they wanted to demonstrate that in some cases the sample might, might have less of one clone than another, and there might be some normal cells put in there. Okay. And, um, and here I think they wanted to demonstrate that, well, we're actually pretty good at de delineating. Um, th there's not that many normal cells in the sample that we have because we can, we can cut things out pretty well. So they wanted to reduce the number of normal cells. And, Finally, what I decided to do is move the last icon, which indicated how mutated genes are shown, next to the cell that is, that is most relevant to, rather than all the way at the bottom. So now you have a, almost a gradient of symbol visual weights and also of importance. And everything is grouped together. Uh, and that was, that was the, the final thing. Now, what you notice is that they're sparse. The cells are sparse. They're put on a hex grid. And the reason why I put them on a hex grid um, is as I always wanted to do. I loved playing strategy games when I was younger on hex grids. And I always wanted to, to use hex grids. But I also wanted to give the reader a feeling of things are organized for you. And when I put it on a hex grid, nobody's going to think, oh, is that really how it is? No, it's not like that. But we know it's not like that because it's been highly stylized here. Whereas in the original figure where you saw the cells overlapping, um, you're wondering, well, how, much, how many cells are there anyway? Is this a reflection of the density of cells? Clearly, this is not a reflection of the density of the cells because it's been highly stylized. Previously, it wasn't highly stylized. So you might think, is it being accurate? Is it trying to be accurate? What is happening? Um, and, again, and so finally, I wanted to just draw your attention to the differences in the legends. And if I were to take the labels away, I think you might and, and I were to ask you to rate the uh, degrees of priority or the degrees of severity for each of the icons, I think you might do a better job over here than over here. Um, OK, I don't have time for this. So um, thanks for suffering through my slightly disordered slides. And I'd be happy to take any questions.